My name is Julie Ann Link and welcome to the Music Link. This week on the Let's Link project, I'd like to welcome the solo bassoonist with the Wind Quintet, Wind Sync, and a founding member of the Breaking Winds Bassoon Quartet, Kara Lamore. Kara, thank you so much for being here. Hey, thanks for having me all the way over in New Zealand. <laughs> For everyone watching, Kara and I grew up in Dallas, Texas together about 20 years ago, playing in the Greater Dallas Youth Orchestra and the Philharmonia Orchestra. Kara went to the Plano East Senior High School and I went to the Plano Senior High School where we both did marching band. In America, we aren't able to march with our bassoon. So I was in the color guard and marched with the clarinet. Kara, what did you do in marching band? Well, it sounds like we had a similar experience. I did color guard, which I loved. And then the senior year, I was the drum major, which is the conductor of the marching band. Wow. So Kara, please share an overview of who you are and what you do as a professional musician. Sure, yeah, thanks for having me. So um, my career has taken a bit of a winding turn since I left the traditional conservatory music school system that so many of us go through. Um, it's gone through a lot of different teaching, um, performance experiences, orchestral and otherwise, but kind of has landed on a career as a chamber musician, and I'm getting more and more comfortable saying that that's what it is. There are so few of us who specialize in chamber music, but I'm fortunate that that really can make up most of my full-time activity. So with Wind Sync, my wind quintet, um, of course, I'm playing bassoon in this wind quintet repertoire, but we're also working on a lot of creative projects. So that involves commissioning and premiering new works for the wind quintet, um, arranging pre-existing works that sound awesome as chamber music you would never expect. Um, everything from single keyboard music all the way to full orchestral music um, can be really engaging on wind quintet. And then we also do a lot of educational, creative, and community-driven work. Um, so it feels like a very well-rounded sort of activity, actually. Um, and then outside of that, I'm doing the Breaking Winds Bassoon Quartet. Um, I play new music, um, more experimental contemporary style music with a small group in Houston called Loop 38. And then I'm taking on other freelance work on top of that in the Houston area, which is pretty good, um, pretty big metro area. So there's a lot of music to be had. So Kara, you're living in Houston, Texas now. Do you ever go back to Dallas and visit? Yes, um, it's, it's actually really wonderful that my folks, so my parents are still living there, um, the house where I grew up, that's where they're living. And so I can even just be back in my old neighborhood. Um, I've been able to stay relatively connected with some of my teachers too, especially in band. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of my band directors have moved to other school districts uh, or retired even um, but it's cool to keep in touch with them and actually like even at the end of college I went back to my high school to Plano East and uh, performed with the Breaking Winds we did a little bassoon quartet recital um, and I love that I, I don't know what you think Julie I feel like we really grew up in a special music education system like the fact that our massive public school district had a, a fine arts department and a focus on music and was able to get instruments to kids was really like, you know, lightning in a bottle special type stuff. Um, I feel really lucky and try to give back when I can too. Yes, Kara, I think it was such a special place and I think um, have so much uh, appreciation for our band directors during that time and their passion and, and it was such a, a fun, fun time with marching band and your friends and making music together and learning shows and um, definitely have a huge appreciation now um, looking back so many years ago. Um, how did you first get introduced to music? I think that everybody has music in their lives, right? Just walking around at the grocery store or whatever. And I always loved music just being out and about. But some people in my family also played instruments. Um, my dad plays bass guitar and my dad's cousin played piano. I always loved sitting on the piano bench with her uh, and my grandmother. Um, it was amazing. My grandmother still practices piano now. Um, and so having that around me, having my grandmother turn on orchestra concerts on PBS at night, all that stuff really did affect me. And so they got me reading music 
really from almost too young of an age, like it, mean, it means I can't really improvise or any of this, but I was reading music kind of as soon as I could sit on the piano bench um, wow. and doing piano lessons. Yeah. That's amazing, Kara. Did you always know that you wanted to go into music and play music? No, I wanted to go into every field and it was hard to come to terms with the fact that I couldn't be everything. I was one of those just ultra curious kids, I think. Um, so I really loved music. I thought maybe I wanted to be a bassoonist. I also really loved creative writing. Um, foreign languages have always really charmed me. I loved my French classes in high school and then later uh, Chinese classes in college. Um, I thought it would be really interesting to have a job where I could travel the world. And the fun part is that now I kind of do. Like, you know, we met up in New Zealand most recently, which is very far from our hometown. Mm -hmm. um, so I just, I wasn't sure, but I, I kept everything kind of going, hoping that I could just explore and, and keep so much of it around for as long as possible. Um, and I'm, I don't regret that at all. I'm really glad I studied a lot of different subjects. Mm. Have you picked up any um, instruments other than bassoon over the years? I mean, so I mentioned I started on piano. Um, I was also pretty active in the youth choir scene before I took up the bassoon, uh, to the point where like everyone thought I was going to be a singer and they offered me like the lead role in the fifth grade musical, which was not glamorous that year. It was Johnny Appleseed. Um, <laughs> So I had like this lovely, uh, I guess, cross-dressing, funky Johnny Appleseed role, and that was kind of the end of my musical theater career. <laughs> um, and, and, but that's basically it. I don't really double, and because I started on bassoon, which in our school district growing up, that was a thing, um, and that's uncommon. I, I didn't end up learning other woodwinds. Yeah. Where did you go to college and what did you study? So I went to the Eastman School of Music for undergrad with a bassoon performance degree. Um, I guess if we have young bassoonists on the call, um, some people like to know that I didn't start at Eastman. I started at Harvard, which does not have a music degree, pretty well-known school. So you can imagine what it was like, but there was no music performance. Um, and it, there, I was just studying a mix of subjects wanting to explore. Um, I did some writing courses. That's where I studied intensive Chinese. Um, and actually, I was able to do a study abroad course in Beijing, which was awesome, just the coolest formative experience. Um, and so I carry some of that with me still. Um, but bassoon really, it came to, to the front of my attention and I wanted it to be my degree. So I graduated from the Eastman School of Music um, I also have a master's degree from Northwestern University, so two American schools. My teachers were John Hunt and Christopher Millard. The Eastman School of Music is pretty cool because the campus is so compact. Um, it's all in downtown Rochester, New York, a very cold city, so you want to spend a lot of time in the practice room. I found it to be an environment where I could focus a lot, and that was really nice. Um, sometimes the smallness was challenging though, um, and I wanted to escape, and I, I felt confused, like, why am I not happy right now? Um, that happens to so many people. At Eastman, for a lot of us, it was around maybe junior year when things were starting to get real. Like, we're going to have to leave music school sometime, and what happens when we do? Um, and that's around the time, actually, when the Breaking Winds bassoon quartet started to play more and more together. And so these kinds of friendships were important to me. Mm. Wow, Kara. So during that time, did you start to, you know, question about changing careers or were there any, you know, other options that you were thinking of pursuing? Yes, I constantly, I, I guess, yeah, for years and years actually thought, okay, I should probably keep alternate careers at the back of my mind. Hmm. So yes, um, but I, I actually want to say um, something interesting that I've learned being out in the professional world is that like a, a bassoon career means something different for every bassoonist. Um, even bassoonists who have 
the most incredible tenure track, fully funded chairs and the most major orchestras have this really rich life as a bassoonist that incorporates a lot of different career elements. And that's where I actually feel hope and optimism is knowing that I have so many different elements going on that all feed into my life as a bassoonist. I, I think like it's fair to say, yeah, I'm a bassoonist and I don't know what my revenue income streams are at, at any given time, um, but it just is who, it, who, who I am and that some of that will always be active for me at this point. Kara, something that comes to mind is just through this pandemic and have been encouraging people to just, you know, pursue their passions, especially in music. And if there's something like a project or anything that inspires them to just do it and try and you never yeah. know where it can lead. Um, yeah. Could you tell me more about your music teachers and how they influenced you? Sure. Um, growing up, actually, Julie, you and I had some kind of overlapping teachers and experiences. Um, I, I want, I do want to say that like my, even my general music teacher in elementary school and uh, band teacher in middle school were all fantastic. Um, when I got to ninth grade, I had a band director named Jana Harvey who would just drill us on technique and she was hard on us. And it was the first time I had a music teacher who really just kept it on us and, and tried to keep us moving upward. Um, and it was because she wanted to prepare us for kind of a brutal system of auditioning for honors and all state awards and all this. And it really worked. And I am so grateful to her for developing my technique. She was a clarinetist, but it didn't matter. She was the person helping me uh, on that side. Um, moving up through high school, Herman Vogelstein, my teacher in Dallas was um, introducing me to the importance of read making and what an interesting thing that a musician has to know some other skill but he was really great about bringing that point home to me and, and getting me an early start in read making. Um, John Hunt, my undergrad teacher, he was such a, um, a teacher who would just so personalize each lesson so not even just teaching to my learning style but teaching to who I was each time that I set foot in the studio. Um, that was him teaching me how to teach um, and also him teaching me how to teach myself. How glorious is that? That was just like such a gift, I think. Always checking in on how I was taking myself through my own practice and making my own corrections for myself. Um, and then Chris Millard in grad school, um, hugely influential. He's kind of the teacher who I still call in a panic when I have something thorny to work through um, because he he just gets it. Um, this is someone who's put the study and the research into the bassoon and when he found a problem like not accepting it as a mystery he's gone through and tried to do the acoustics research or dig through the historic manuscript or you name it call a conductor whatever he does it and so he has the the knowledge that backs up his playing and his teaching. Um, I, I find that deeply inspiring. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Kara, what have you learned about the music industry since graduating? <laughs> Too much. I have to shut my mouth now. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. Uh, <laughs> okay, so since graduating, um, I've because I didn't jump so wholeheartedly into the um, really intense audition circuit right off the bat and then like get that chair and like sit in my tenured position um, as a young performer. Um, I, I grew through experience and did come to see many angles of the music industry. And now as someone who does a lot of programming and artistic work for my wind quintet. Um, I see a lot of that, that stuff coming to play in my work, you know, as a bassoonist, basically. Okay, so um, I learned about grant writing. I learned about um, the model in the United States that supports the arts, which is the nonprofit organization. 
Um, and that's really important. So that depends on individual donors and it depends on musicians building personal relationships with people in their community. And past that, I learned about mission-driven work and how important that is for our organizations, again, especially in the United States, that we connect to other disciplines. Um, I'm working sometimes with scientists, sometimes with elementary educators, uh, sometimes with someone at a hospital, and it, it just depends, but that work has to connect and, and be vital and important to your community. Um, unfortunately, kind of due to the fact that you have to justify your own existence in the United States. Mm. Yeah. Um, mm. But but it's beautiful because it really makes the music making more meaningful as well. Hmm. Yeah. Kara, tell me about your teaching career. Teach, teaching is something that I love and find so important and, uh, and teaches me, right? Everyone says that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so right now, most of my teaching is as a visiting artist. And that's... Um, a little bit challenging in that I don't get to follow up and see if my work made an impact long term on the students playing. Um, so I kind of can only cross my fingers and hope. Um, that's the main challenge is I'm not getting a ton of real time feedback about how effective things are. But what I am learning is how to diagnose a wide variety of problems and a wide variety of players. And I'm learning about so many different styles and approaches and how to respond to them, which I, I hope is um, really refining that like holistic quality to my teaching. Mm. Um, I'm visiting youth orchestras. So sometimes I'm teaching beginning bassoonists. Sometimes the beginning bassoonists are 11 years old and sometimes they're 18 years old. And, and that's a difference developmentally too. Um, I'm visiting universities, so sometimes I'm teaching people who are older than me and more experienced than me, but, but needing to know how to give the feedback that just like communicate, communicates what I'm hearing in my ear mm -hmm. and maybe starting a dialogue about how each of us would approach this problem, hopefully coming toward an agreement of, of a way that maybe even both of us could move forward um, on that problem. Um, and then I do some teaching in the public school as well. So band kids, and that is always really special to me because, um, you know, as we keep circling back to in this conversation, um, it feels comfortable and it feels like I'm giving back to a younger version of myself mm -hmm. if I'm sitting next to a bassoonist in her band class, um, which is something that I'm doing, actually. I'll, I'll be sitting in and help, you know, playing along with her band music or playing second bassoon in a program where maybe there's only one bassoonist, something like that. Mm. Um, previously, I was teaching um, full-time at, at a university, at the University of Missouri. So that's a, a large public university in the central United States. Um, and I had a studio of anywhere between three and nine performers. Wow. Um, it was kind of funny. It was like a flexible come, come and go sort of atmosphere. But um, um, the great challenge and joy of that was, was building a community there in that city, on that campus, the community aspect of that studio was really kind of the most important part of leading that studio. And mm -hmm. I do want to connect it back to what I picked up from my teachers, which um, it, there's this saying that what you teach is who you are, mm -hmm. right? And in music, we're really lucky that we work one-on-one -on -one with someone for an extended period of time. And very few fields get this kind of mentorship. Mm -hmm. And I think through you you're kind of learning about uh, your own humanity and, and trying to become a better person. Um, and, and so, yeah, that's kind of my feeling about uh, the university level bassoon training is that um, that's kind of the most important part of it, yeah, mm -hmm. the mentorship. Hmm. Kara, you do a lot of travel with WinSync and the Breaking Winds Bassoon Quartet. How do you stay organized? <laughs> Sometimes I just cross my fingers and what happens, <laughs> happens. 
I will say that, so first of all, working in chamber music, because you have a small group of people who are all doing um, work that's not just showing up and sitting in your chair prepared, uh, there's a lot more to it. Mm. And because of that, it becomes a coworker atmosphere and a family atmosphere. And so you learn a lot about trusting each other and basically like doing your group projects when you're a kid, um, learning how to expedite things for each other, build on each other's strengths, mm. um, help each other when someone's going through a moment of weakness too. Um, so I bring that up because you also learn to let things go a lot. Mm. And um, there's something so beautiful um, when I come to a moment of recognition of, oh, I should just let this go and let's work on the next thing and and, and we'll be fine. Um, so moments of disorganization happen because I am traveling a lot and maybe I drop balls in cer certain areas of my life. Maybe I let something slip um, and I'm not blowing it off. I'm just thinking, okay, th that's fine. This is, that was yesterday, this is today. Let's move forward and grow through this. The nitty gritty of the organizational thing like is absolutely the, the soon practice the read making and the packing. Those are the three main organizational areas that I really actually need to be mindful of um, because I might not practice on a day when I have to travel to Winnipeg from Houston. <laughs> um, read making. Uh, so at, in Houston, I'm at sea level, which is similar to New Zealand. Um, and it's a very challenging read making um, style, I think. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, reads want to just flop open and mm -hmm. be gushy because it's kind of tropical and mm -hmm. this whole thing. Um, so I need to be careful to leave my reads a little bit thicker because I'll probably need to scrape something down mm -hmm. once I'm at my new location. Um, so it just requires thinking a few days ahead of the day mm -hmm. that I'm going to fly and making sure everything is, is paced out. So you're right, there is organization there. Um, for the most part, I use a bullet journal, just to speak mm -hmm. very practically here. I like to have stuff handwritten, and a bullet journal is just a little to-do list that I use, sort of a key to organize. Um, with the practice, I, I need to pretty much every day be doing some memory work because I play a lot of memorized recitals. I also need to be breaking in some reads mm -hmm. and I need to be learning music for maybe an upcoming program that's something closer to like a woodshed kind of thing. Yes. So that's how I stay organized. Wow. Do you have any favorite chamber music pieces that come to mind? <laughs> so I love chamber music and there are so many favorites, um, but I will say so uh, in the wind quintet, um, it's it's hard to just love, love, love the standards over a sustained period of time because the wind quintet has so few standards. But I would say my favorite wind quintet that I still just think is a masterpiece and you can't convince me otherwise is the Nielsen wind quintet. Mm -hmm. It's just a glorious piece. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I could play it every day. That's fine. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> amazing piece. Um, for... You know, it's funny, like, I play a lot of bassoon quartet type music, too, and I have to say um, the Corette La Phoenix is probably still my favorite bassoon quartet piece. Yeah. Mm. Gotta go with the oldest and the greatest. Um, <laughs> and then just generally, you know, because then I end up at festivals where I'm hearing these just world-class musicians play incredible chamber music. Um, I really love Messiaen's Quartet for the End of Time. Mm. Um, it's just a really special piece to me. And, oh, another one, probably an all-time just important piece in my development that I will play any day is the Schubert Octet. Mm. Um, it's so long and so hard for the violin. So it's just a real gift when anyone's willing to learn that piece for me. Yeah. Wow. Could you share more about your orchestra career? Yes, well, we overlapped during some of my most active orchestral stuff. Um, 
you know, everybody in school is training orchestrally and we all get that experience. And, and I was going through the typical pipeline. So I did my orchestra at Eastman, Northwestern, and then playing uh, a good bit with the Civic Orchestra of Chicago. So even getting into the training orchestra land. And then um, I had the wonderful opportunity to play two different casual player contracts at the NZSO in Wellington. Um, that was so exciting. I, I feel like, yeah, it was just one year, um, but traveling to New Zealand and having an international orchestral experience was pretty life-changing for me. Um, and you and I did a tour together. That was incredible. Yeah. Um, I love playing all over New Zealand. And actually the NZSO that season did one of the Hobbit movies. So I played in the soundtrack. It was um, the Desolation of Smaug, the second movie. Which, so cool. you know, yeah, it just, it made me feel cool. I was like, yes, this is so Hollywood. This, this is my <laughs> fabulous celebrity dream come true. I don't know, it felt great. <laughs> yeah. Um, but back stateside, um, orchestrally, I am pretty much just subbing if I can take time off between uh, tours with my quintet. And honestly, I wouldn't have expected that um, orchestra is just like, if I have time sort of thing, because I do love orchestra, but um, that's mostly what I do now. Freelancer, I guess. Yeah. Do you have a favorite concert experience that you'd like to share about? Um, oh, you know, so I think I'll, I have two and they're both from New Zealand just because I'm thinking about New Zealand. So one I'll nominate is playing with Julie on Symphony Fantastique oh. <laughs> because bassoonists never get to have these big mega sections like the horns do every other concert. And so when we can have our own like party in our section, <laughs> you know, get a little rowdy during rehearsal, <laughs> hanging out. That's so awesome. That's one of my favorite things. So I really loved playing Symphony Fantastique and finally having this big section um, with NZSO. And then the other funny NZSO experience was that uh, that orchestra tours and we went to play I feel like it was in Christchurch when there was a concert at the basketball arena or something. Uh -huh. Does sound yes. So we were playing at a basketball arena, um, which had a kind of boomy acoustic, and you could actually hear the audience pretty well. And so a soloist played a gorgeous encore, and everything was perfectly still, just one solo instrument. And after the final release, an audience member burped pretty loudly. <laughs> There was a huge belch. <laughs> and, and then he was like, oh, excuse me. <laughs> it was still just very quiet. <laughs> and everyone burst into laughter. Um, I love it. I love, it. like, obviously mm -hmm. it's really, it was hilarious. It's like one of the funniest things that's, that I've experienced on stage. But also just, that's what music's about. Yeah. <laughs> It's, it's about a, like a feedback from your audience and a uh -huh. give and take a dialogue and, and, and humor sometimes, moments of humor. So I love that moment. And being part of your family. It's like we're just all friends. Yeah. <laughs> I guess sharing a meal together or something. Yeah. <laughs> Kara, tell me about a memorable audition or competition experience. Okay, I knew this, I knew you were going to ask this question, and I'm glad I thought about it, because, you know, so many of us, we think auditions, competitions, ah, we just have, like, the fear in our hearts, mm -hmm. uh, and so I'm going to tell you about an audition experience that uh, taught me a lesson, I think, around mm -hmm. that, which is, um, I was going from Chicago to Omaha to take an audi audition for the Omaha Symphony, and it was evening and I was commuting with another bassoonist and uh, we actually, we, we wrecked my car. Um, yeah, we were out in one of those dark areas where deer jump across the highway and mm. sometimes unavoidable. Um, yeah, so that happened. We had a collision with a deer. Um, kind of a crazy moment for that to happen. 
the audition was scheduled for the next day, but we said, okay, we'll see what we can do to actually make it. Um, and a state trooper, like a policeman, drove us back to Des Moines, the nearest city, and we stayed there overnight. The following day, we said, let's just do it. I'm going to take this audition. Rented a car. <laughs> My car was off in a junkyard somewhere by then. Rented a car, went back, backtracked, and got to the audition. I was on the phone with my car insurance right up until the moment I was called on stage. And so I had pretty much written this off. I was just like, this is good for my friend and, and I'm gonna get this done. Mm -hmm. um, stepped on stage, played the best audition of my life, advanced the whole thing. And I said, oh, cool. <laughs> um, right, so, and I, and I didn't win the audition, uh, my friend Nick Nelson, who would actually be fun to talk to, uh, yeah. one of the shows still plays there actually. Um, but I felt like pretty great about how I played yeah. despite this crazy time I was going through. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, you do these like audition prep things, you know, like we'll buy these books, like do this and this and this at this time, this way. Um, here's your audition game plan. Um, and I was trying to do all those things, mm -hmm. but they were making me more nervous. Um, so yeah, I, I don't worry as much about that stuff anymore, actually. Um, being distracted actually helped me the most. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and that was a beautiful lesson. It was like, I already had it inside me. <laughs> I knew how these excerpts went. I know how to play the bassoon. Yes. So now just like, bring yourself, bring yourself. And that's all you, I didn't even have a car. I just brought myself. Oh. <laughs> Lesson to learn. How do you cope with music performance anxiety? <laughs> well, okay. So if you had to ask, am I like in the top 50% of performance anxiety, like people, I would say probably. Um, I've, I've found that I've wasted, not wasted, but I, there have been so many long years of really strange moments where I get into the audition and I can't even produce a tone that I recognize as my own, yeah. or I get on stage and, I mean, I've played a recital where I had to leave the stage in the middle of a piece. Um, this is a thing and it happens to so many people and that's why I mm -hmm. feel like, okay, sharing this. Um, yeah. So... I, I do want to, like, I guess just say that um, using beta blockers has helped me, and mm. it's, like, um, kind of a taboo topic, and it probably shouldn't be. Mm. Uh, uh, it's It's been kind of, like, the only way for me to, like, regain my, my you know, grip on the bassoon yes. at times. I'm so grateful to be able to have something that can bring me closer to like a better representation of, of who I am and how I play. Mm -hmm. um, so beta blockers, I think are helpful. I'll just be real mm -hmm. about that. Yeah. Practice is helpful. So um, for instance, when I play recitals with WinSync, my wind quintet, we, well, I, I, I like don't really get nervous, mm -hmm. but we sometimes get nervous. And it's usually if we haven't played a show in a few months. Mm -hmm. um, so I know that the repetition and practice really do help. Mm -hmm. um, people who are hot on the audition circuit who can take like 10 auditions a year probably also um, could attest to this. Although, you know, right now that's not even <laughs> possible. But right. yeah, I mean, it's it, the, the practice actually does help. Um, so mm -hmm. throwing yourself into the fire. Um, and lastly, uh, for me, if we are talking about like, I, know, I don't know, like strategies, um, sure. I really like a body scan. Uh, like something you might do in yoga or in meditation is just mm. um, checking in with how does my head feel? If I take a breath, what does it feel like as I fill my lungs? Um, what do my shoulders feel like? Are they in line or are they scrunched up? Let me like just double check. Um, and by going kind of from the top of my head down to my feet and seeing how I feel, I'm suddenly more um, more aware and then hopefully able to control some of the tenser areas better. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Beautiful, Kara. Um, can you talk a little bit more about your memory practice? You mentioned that you do this 
every day. Can you share some more, um, you know, skills and, and ways to improve this? Sure. I wish I had like a magical method and maybe I'll start thinking on that so that I can make a lot of money. <laughs> for now, um, let me say that, that the reason why I can memorize is because I'm required to. So everybody could. It's just that for a lot of us, it's an option and it is a big hill to climb and mm -hmm. it is a lot of investment of time. Um, so it's tough to, to really find the right time and place to start. Um, at this point, I really prefer to memorize all of my solo repertoire, and I, of course, need to if I'm playing a show for Winsync. Um, basically, stuff that speeds up my memory is to chunk it, but not like the typical practice chunking. I'm actually mm -hmm. thinking more about the form of a piece. So I figure out what's the A section, the B section, the C section. Um, does the A section have any material that looks similar later? Because if stuff comes back in different keys, I'm going to be more likely to play it in the wrong key if I'm going only by muscle memory. Mm. <laughs> um, and then what are, what are some like rhythmic differences as well um, and articulation differences? Mm -hmm. um, once I can identify those, then I can start getting my like intellectual understanding of the piece. Yes. Um, and then I can start digging in. The next step would then be muscle memory, and that's important too. Um, so, you know, like, can I play through um, one phrase while staring at myself on the phone not, and, like, not cheating wow. and looking at the music? Can I just uh -huh. do that? And how can I do it while I'm um, looking in the mirror and there's a podcast playing on the other side of the room? Um, so basically trying to get my brain distracted and letting the muscles be the only like nervous system stuff that's in action. Yes. Um, and then the other part of it is um, now can I play it in context? So um, as soon as I play something with my group, it's going to be a sensory overload and I'll make mistakes I wasn't expecting to. So mm -hmm. for that, I usually play along with recordings. Wow. And I think for solo rep, this is great too. Mm -hmm. Playing along with the recording, maybe you won't hear what the bassoonist does as well because you're trying to play their part, but you will hear how the pianist responded to what they did. And that's key because you need, you need to get used to that before you try playing memorized wow. with your pianist and finding that to be the case. Have you experienced any music related injuries? Yeah, that's, so that's an interesting question, and I, I think, like, I think the answer is probably just no. I think I should say I don't have great tips for people who deal with chronic performance injuries. I occasionally get flare-ups of, like, a tendonitis or pre-tendonitis sort of feeling in my arms, and in that case, um, I'm, I'm resting mm -hmm. and I'm massaging. Like, you can do some really great self-massage if this is something that uh, you experience, um, and, and yeah, just leave it be before it gets too bad. Because I do have friends who, for instance, like brass players who would play through scars in their lips and then ultimately need like surgery to remove scar tissue. And, and these sorts of things can happen to us too. It's usually something in our arms or our hands or like a TMJ issue, right? Um, taking days off is okay. Like mm. you can come back, be fine. And then the other thing that I would emphasize is that my equipment helps me to be injured less. I play on a very light bassoon. Mm -hmm. um, and, and finding the right harness and the right seat strap that balances the weight of your bassoon can change everything. Mm -hmm. um, if I switch, for instance, I actually, I play on a fox sometimes and a heckle sometimes. Wow. And if I switch to the fox from the same harness as the heckle, suddenly I can't play stuff as fast. Wow. And this to me is like perfect evidence that the weight of the bassoon is different and, you know, it, something physical has changed. Mm -hmm. um, and if, if we can figure out how to listen to our bodies and like notice like, oh yeah, I'm not playing so quick, um, we have the chance to make the adjustment. So equipment yes. kind of matters, but mm -hmm. it could be as simple as just like, you know, changing your balance hanger or something. 
Mm -hmm. um, but it's worth doing and experimenting anyway, with. Like, Kara, what is TMJ? Oh, that's, um, it's a jaw issue. Wow. So sometimes the students who hold tension in their face mm. um, have a hard time recovering from, you know, like pure, like, you know, sustained stress. Mm. That way. Okay. And some people are just, just predisposed to it, mm -hmm. which is tough. Yeah. Mm. Tell me more about your read making style and techniques. I am probably still developing my read style. I think I would be the first to say like my read style is maybe like an experimental style. Um, but some features of reads that I've come to like, I like reads with like a slightly wider throat than the typical American read. Mm -hmm. And um, the reason why is because I can, I, I find that I can get a smoother color note to note, mm. just a slightly wider throat. Um, and so I can worry less about wah, 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 all the fiddling in the jaw and the embouchure. Um, I would really prefer to keep that stuff kind of stable. Mm -hmm. um, so that's one big thing that I quite like. Another thing is I mentioned before living in Houston, the reads want to be gushy or pop open. And, mm -hmm. and so it's hard for me to get the collapse, which I like it if my read can collapse in a uniform way and, and if it's ready to collapse mm -hmm. um, when I apply air pressure to it. Mm. Um, so what I do to make the, the read is um, I'll, I'll just like make the whole blank in one day. And I find that that helps the cane get, like, you know, um, Chris Millard says it has like a memory, right? Yeah. Like the cane has a little bit more of a memory of already wanting to collapse and, and having a little bit of that profile of a finished read. Um, it, then I have to do less work to it. And God knows I need so much work. <laughs> <laughs> what are important skills learned through music that apply to everyday life? Wow, what a question. <laughs> <laughs> um, y you know, as musicians, we all kind of live, live that life, right? It's like its own lifestyle. Mm -hmm. um, and so I would say, like, it's hard for us to know because we're fish in the fishbowl. Um, maybe discipline, uh, maybe uh, grit. I actually do think musicians have a lot of grit. Mm -hmm. I think we have a really great ability to, to multitask. Mm -hmm. um, I think we have quite a good understanding of um, needing to stick up for ourselves and, and um, sort of diversify our talents. Um, I, I think that creativity is huge in all aspects of life and it comes more naturally to a musician. Um, problem solving and actually like being a good coworker. I mean, we learn a lot sitting next to different people all the time, uh, trying to work in chamber music groups with people from different backgrounds and of different instruments. Um, I mean, I could go on and on. Mm. Um, I, would, I would love to maybe like meet up with someone who's like an expert in, um, you know, like the business world, like in workplaces mm. to learn more about, um, you know, like, like how awesome we are in workplaces. I bet uh -huh. we actually like have learned a lot of these really great skills just because of our training and our everyday practice. Yes. Mm. Is there any advice that you can share for musicians just starting out a music career and yeah, and going on that, just that path? Mm. Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah, your, your musicianship reflects who you are. So um, so don't lose sight of that. Um, you do need to work hard. It's just a non-negotiable, but come to know yourself, your work style, your prefer, your, your preference of how you express yourself, your favorite repertoire. 
Um, maybe you have an additional interest in um, another science or arts field and you should learn all about that too because that probably applies to music as well. And then the other thing worth knowing is that music schools and universities, campuses all over have resources that the real world doesn't. So if you have a research interest or if you want to apply for money <laughs> at school to do something, if you want to produce a certain concert that reflects your artistic interest, um, if you want to meet someone from another institution, all of that you can do at school. And it's so awesome if you do it then, because that could be a launching point for something huge in your ultimate career path. Um, the other thing is, I, I would just say to jump in without fear, even though it's tough. Uh, people probably unavoidably will run into certain fears, but um, you're going to end up where you need to end up. And it's okay if it's not what your teacher did, because I'm sorry, it won't be what your teacher did because good news, we all have our own individual path. Uh, and you get to find out what that is. That's so exciting. Like, I'm just so excited for people who are just starting out. I feel like I've already revealed some of my cards. I know kind of where I'm headed, you know? Um, and yeah, that's, that's something to celebrate um, and just jump into. Mm. Kara, that's beautiful advice. Um, just the last question, you mentioned um, getting in touch with Nick Nelson. Um, are there any other bassoonists or people that come to mind to be interviewed next? Sure, I mean, all, Nick Nelson is great. I feel like all of my bassoon friends are so wonderful. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know, I, I mean, I'd love to connect you with anyone and everyone. Okay. Uh, <laughs> so we could talk later. Um, who are some cool bassoonists that you guys should know? Um, I don't know. I feel like I should just tell you later, but you guys should okay. be listening far and wide to any and all bassoonists. Mm. Um, you know what I mean? Like that's, yeah. it's, it's something that we're getting more and more aware of now. Mm -hmm. um, and it's really exciting. Like, oh, actually I'm in Charleston, South Carolina right now. Um, uh, my friend Quinn Delaney, who plays in Charleston is super awesome and an artistic. I know that last week uh, you spoke with Amanda Swain. She's my fellow Houston bassoonist. Um, even in our cities, we have these really incredible um, fellow bassoonists we can learn from. Um, so that's pretty exciting. Mm. Kara, thank you so much for this interview today. It's wonderful to get a glimpse into your life and career as a professional musician. Well, thanks, Julie. I feel like we're having coffee back over in mm -hmm. New Zealand together. It'll happen again. Mm -hmm, definitely, Kara. Mm. For everyone tuning in, keep an eye out for new videos with great bassoon guests every Thursday, Central Standard Time. On the Let's Link project, every guest interviewed here is hosting an open panel discussion via Zoom the following Sunday, Central Standard Time. And you can register for free for Kara's session on the Music Link website. Please like, comment, and share any questions or feedback in the section below, and subscribe to this channel for new video notifications each week. The Music Link is a New Zealand-based online resource for people to share, learn, and connect. Thank you for watching, and I'll see y'all in the next video.